Welcome back to The Real News Network and Reality Asserts Itself. I'm Paul Jay, and joining us again in the studio is Professor Leo Panitch. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Glad to be here, Paul. Now, one more time, Leo Panitch is Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar at York University in Toronto, co-editor of the annual Socialist Register and co-author of the book with Sam Gindon, The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire. Thanks for joining us again. So, 1967, you head off to go to school in London. Uh, 67 is leading the year before 1968. This is a rather tumultuous period all over the world. I mean, uh, in terms of ebb and flow of the mass movement, this is one of the real peaks of the 20th century. Your trip to London, your trip going to school, uh, created a lifelong connection between you and what was going on in Labour Party politics having known Miliband and had known his kids and then you became f uh, friends with Tony Benn who was leader of the left I guess of the, of the, of the Labour Party and was a minister. Uh, talk about, lead us up uh, to yeah. Corbyn and today uh, and, and, and the fight. Uh, give us the roots of the fight yeah. surrounding Jeremy Corbyn who's now the Labour Party uh, leader now. There's a direct threat. Uh, I arrived uh, in the UK not only at the time of the swinging 60s and Mick Jagger, etc., but at the time of uh, this uh, trade union militancy, this explosion of strikes. Uh, you know, in the 60s, it was true in the States and in Canada as well, uh, with full employment, uh, a young worker felt uh, that he or she could make very high wage demands without being afraid of losing their jobs, uh, could challenge and attempt to change what was going on in the labor process, whether in a hospital or in a factory, right? Uh, and, uh, that's the thing about full employment. It, it removes the fear that workers have from being fired. I arrived in the middle of that and saw a labor government uh, passing legislation uh, which was getting those workers repressed, uh, which was mainly oriented to securing wage restraint. And who's the la leader at the time? And that's Harold Wilson, uh, who was the Prime Minister of Britain from 1964 to 1970. And the central conflict in Britain at that time appeared ironically to be between the Labour government and the unions. And the Labour Party was a party created by the unions the, which the unions funded, and which they provided the vast majority of the membership. Sounds in, awfully familiar to the situation in the United States. Yeah. At that time, it was going on as well. Um, so I became fascinated with this conflict. It appeared that the class struggle was taking place inside the party of the workers. And I ended up writing a PhD thesis on this. Uh, Miliband's famous book, uh, the book that made him famous was called Parliamentary Socialism, uh, which said that the Labour Party was the most dogmatic of parties, not about socialism, but about parliamentarism. That's how it opens. And I kind of felt that, yeah, that's true, but there's parliamentarism, parliamentarism. You know, there were communist parties in France and in, uh, Italy, uh, which were much more oriented to a Marxist tradition, etc. Uh, there were different kinds of parliamentarism. What really struck me about the Labour Party was that it was committed to class harmony. It was committed to reconciling the differences between workers and capitalists. And that was right in its original ideological programmatic foundation. Right? And it seemed to me that that was the difference. But, but since it was a workers' party, class struggle inevitably appeared in that party. So you got this ideological attempt to say, in the national interest, we'll all get together. Well, inevitably, workers were going to be in a situation in which they'd get engaged in class struggle. And this was the central tension in the party. And I wrote a PhD thesis called Social Democracy and Industrial Militancy. It was my first book. Cambridge University Press published it, which was about the conflict between the unions and the labor governments at that time. And in the course of that, I got to know the Labour Party well, very critically. Came to the view that there were, although there were many socialists in the Labour Party, 
they'd never be able to change the Labour Party because it would split it. And where are you when you're writing this? I wrote it in Britain. In Britain. Uh, Just finished it when I came back to Canada and started teaching at Carleton University, but I was living with one leg on either side of the Atlantic. Uh, somewhere around this time, uh, your father comes to visit you in London yes. and sees a poster of Lenin on your <laughs> wall and was a little shocked by it all. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was very camp. It still is to have Che Guevara on your wall at that time posters of uh, Lenin. I happened to have one of Lenin, which I'd picked up uh, probably in Carnaby Street, uh, of Lenin marching along reading Iskra, uh, the, the uh, party newspaper. Um, and it was sticking you know, up on my wall with thumbtacks. What, what, and he looked at it and said, oh, I see Rose has won, my Aunt Rose, which <laughs> I didn't feel was all the case since I never have been a Leninist. Um, I've always thought that the Bolshevik model uh, doesn't apply to our kinds of societies and had drawbacks even for the Russian Revolution at the time. So that was, it was highly ironic uh, you know, that he would say that. All right, T take us, so what happens to the Labour Party? I mean, as you say, it's, it's actually founding ideology is class reconciliation. Right. Uh, and, and the Wilson government was uh, the sort of epitome of that. Right. Um, then what? Well, uh, out of that ferment inside the party and out of the ferment going on with the development of new movements, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, uh, in Britain, even the black power movement in Britain in the late 60s, that inevitably also begins to percolate inside the Labour Party. Uh, and uh, Tony Benn, in the late 1960s, while still a minister, has a remarkable ear for that. Partly maybe because he had briefly been a journalist, Paul. He he'd worked with the BBC in the late 1940s, was always, always very on top of new media technology as well. But he heard this, and in conjunction with the socialist left in the party, the socialist left in the trade unions, you get, after Wilson is defeated in 1970, uh, you get a insurrection inside the party, of the type that Sanders represents now. Uh, with them articulating the theme in particular that unless you can democratize the Labour Party, make Labour MPs, Labour governments accountable to the resolutions, the more radical resolutions at the party conference, the class struggle, etc., you'll never, if you can't democratize the Labour Party, you'll never democratize the British state. But that's where it has to begin. And Ben articulates that most clearly. I was very much of the root view that this would fail. Uh, that this would lead to the party being split because the right wing of the party had every much right to say, but we represent the real Labour Party. You claim you're going back to something radical before, but you know, this is what the Labour Party has always been. Uh, and I thought I was right uh, to, to be skeptical about it. I was sympathetic. I thought the things that they were advancing were you know, extremely uh, interesting and important. You're talking about the Tony Benn inside the Tony segment. Benn campaign well, for Labour Party think was democracy. The, what did you think was the alternative to the Tony Benn strategy? I was of the view, and I practiced it when I came back to Canada, that our generation, yours and mine, Paul, would find a way to uh, create new working class parties, the last quarter of the 20th century, that would go past social democracy and Leninism that would learn from the mistakes of the Communist parties and the Social Democratic parties, which most of us by the 60s thought had run their historical course as agents of transformative change already, uh, and that we would find the way to a, a new and better politics. A lot of people of our generation became Trotskyists or Maoists. They, in a sense, were f trying to found a better Leninist party. I always thought that they would fail because they took the Bolshevik model as their model. And that seemed to me, both in terms of discourse, language, but also party structure, uh, insurrectionary strategy, not likely to succeed. We failed. I mean, I think that my, that, that certainly failed as a attempt uh, to create a better Leninist party. But those of us who tried, as I did in Canada, when I came back to found new socialist parties also failed. Uh, one has to hope that what's going on now, on now will lead either to a transformation of the old parties or the creation of new ones. But as to your question, you know, I 
admired that struggle. I wrote about it. I ended up writing a big book on it called The End of Parliamentary Socialism from New Left to New Labor, from Ben to Blair, if you like, detailing how the left in the party was defeated. Their tremendous promise, their tremendous creativity. I, I met uh, 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 Jeremy Corbyn through Tony Benn at Tony Benn's house as a young uh, militant in that struggle, and you know, just he was just becoming an MP. Um, he was elected first in 1983. I met John Landsman, who was the founder of Momentum now, as a 22, 23-year-old organizer for the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy and then the campaign manager for Tony Benn's bid for the deputy leadership of the Labour Party. So I've known these people for a long time uh, and admired them for a long time. I never would have believed, after their marginalization, that out of this crisis of social democracy, the way it enveloped itself in hyper-capitalism, the way it embraced market solutions in the face of the contradictions of the welfare state. Meaning Tony Blair. Yeah. Uh, or Clinton. And, and Blair modeled himself in Clinton. In fact, the European Social Democratic Parties modeled themselves on the Democratic Party of the United States, ironically. It used to be that the left in the United States, and to some extent it still is, would look to European social democracy as their model. Well, what was really going on was that European social democrats were modeling themselves on the catch-all U.S. Democratic Party. So the attitude you had previously towards Ben's fight to reform and democratize the Labour Party, um, at the end of the Ben's process, I shouldn't say the end, at a point of Ben's process, you did give rise to right winds and Blair takes over, but you do wind up with a Corbin. And does it say something about th that it is possible to fight within they these will. big, essentially bourgeois parties? We'll have to see. The story is not finished yet. What it does show that is that in these parties there always have been socialists, that they remained as a somewhat coherent, even if for a long period not very powerful or even creative group, both in Parliament and inside the party branches, uh, that that party in particular retained a working class base because of their links to the unions, but also because the class culture in Britain is so much deeper, so, uh, so much, you know, it has so much more resonance amongst working class people, still think of themselves in class terms, much less the case in North America, that there was a seed there, that when this crisis emerged, partly because of the Iraq war, partly because, because there's always been a pacifist tradition, of course, in the Labour Party, but partly because of the tremendous, uh, shameful way in which uh, social democrats everywhere cooperated with the marketization of so much of things that had never been marketized. And let me emphasize, in Iraq war, meaning Tony Blair's complete collaboration Complicity. and knowingly waging an illegal Absolutely. war in Iraq. Absolutely. Yeah. Whereas people like Jeremy Corbyn uh, had been uh, people who had led the campaign for nuclear disarmament, kept it going as an organization into the 21st century. Uh, now, uh, you know, the man who is uh, the chief of staff of Britain's largest union, Unite, Andrew Murray, for a long time been a British communist, was head of the Stop the War Coalition, working very closely with Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party. Now he's joined the Labour Party and is part of this struggle to change the Labour Party. Now we'll have to see whether this goes anywhere. It's gone much further than I thought it would. It's taking more creative forms than I thought it would. But the story's not over and it's hard to believe it will succeed without a split. Uh, without those who know who they are. They're and, not and a split because Corbyn's not taking what I should say, moderate left of center, frankly, Sanders-esque positions. He's gone beyond anything Sanders can. I know it's a very different political situation, and who knows what Sanders might or may not do in that. But if I understand it correctly, he's talking about renationalizing the railroads. He's on international politics. He's taken f far more progressive positions. I mean, it, it, it's a real left progressive it position is. he's taking, and it, it seems to be 
very popular. It is. Uh, it involves renationalizing those public utilities, which is very popular in Britain. Uh, it involves setting up a national investment bank and regional investment banks, which will serve as the infrastructure for municipalized production in all kinds of arenas. Um, uh, yes, it, it's significant in that respect. That said, Corbyn uh, is in favor of getting rid of Britain's nuclear alternative, the Trident submarine, always has been. Uh, that's not party policy, partly because it's not union policy, uh, because there are workers who work in those shipyards where the submarines are refitted, etc. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, uh, he's restrained. Uh, you know, one of the people who is seen as a possible but, but success. He said he is for getting rid of He not. is, but he is being restrained by the fact that that isn't party policy. And he's restrained by what exactly does it mean uh, to uh, try to carry through a socialist policy in Britain when the city of London, the financial sector of Britain, so dominates the whole British economy and it is the center of global finance. So even if you, as the left, British left wanted to do back in the 70s, nationalize the five big banks in Britain, right? what would that mean with Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank and all of the financial services operating in Britain? What, what are the implications of this? This is not worked through, and nor will it be easy to work through. Uh, and they're not going quite there. Uh, you know, that, that's what one needs to look for uh, in terms of what the limits they'll run into. But, you know, that's going to have to be a slow, difficult process as well. Uh, they haven't worked this out, I don't think. And you At can't the blame time, them for having not worked it out. They do have either. a chance of winning. They do have a chance of winning. And they're winning on a radical left program, one that is rehabilitating the concept of socialism that is rehabilitating the notion of politics as not simply being about electing someone to take office and then represent you for four years and then get re-elected or not, that a notion of politics involves popular mobilization and education. Uh, that's not, not only momentum. Corbyn has just set up inside the Labour Party a branch of the party that is, or to, that is about community organizing. Very quickly, uh, Momentum, for people who don't know, is what? Momentum was created at the time of Corbyn's campaign for the leadership of the party, uh, when he barely got enough nominations from other MPs even to put his name forward. And the idea there was just to keep some left ideas alive in a leadership campaign after the previous leader, Ed Miliband, lost the election in 2015 and resigned and there was a leadership contest. And astonishingly, uh, there was this groundswell of support for the guy who was way out in left field, um, who was seen not to be an establishment politician. Uh, and one of the reasons that happened was that uh, this organization called Momentum was created around the guy I mentioned before, John Landsman, who had been a young activist 30 years before in the campaign for Labour Party democracy. And, try to get Ben elected as deputy leader, etc. He now had been brought back by a radical Labour MP to do organizing outside the party. And he linked up with some young people, uh, in particular some young primary school teachers, who had organized a big concert with radical uh, uh, music groups uh, for Corbyn, and it had been a tremendous success in London. And they created, they led the creation of this thing called Momentum, which was to be, we will we'll create popular momentum behind the Corbyn campaign. It also had the effect of sweeping young people to join the Labour Party, to pay three pounds at that time, become a Labour Party supporter and vote for Corbyn. And hundreds of thousands of people joined the Labour Party. Uh, this was unheard of in any social democratic party in a generation, maybe two. Uh, the Labour Party now has almost 600,000 members. The Labour Party youth has 110,000 members. You know, this in itself is a revolution. And unlike the Democratic Party, there's actually a party there. The Democratic Party is plasticine. Uh, it's jello. There is no organizational structure to it. There's no 
apparatus that makes the leadership accountable in any way to a conference that passes policy resolutions, a program, none of that exists. In Britain, there are party branches. Yeah, the platform at, at party conventions is propaganda. It has nothing it has to do no with It has no real effect. That's, that's not true in these parties. Now, and, and, and the, the party branch in Britain has some meaning. It's a place where people go, where activists go. They're usually deadly, boring. Uh, and part of what needs to go on is those branches need to become centers of working class life. They need to become open, welcoming to young people, but also oriented to going out into the community and engaging in campaigns for tenants' rights, for women's rights, organizing people. Uh, you know, the great mass parties when they were created played that kind of role. They were engaged in what is, was known then and will have to be known again as working class formation. Well, as you said, the class struggle is being waged in the party and it ain't over. That's for sure. And the closer Corbyn gets to possible power, the more vicious that struggle is likely to get because as it is with the Democratic Party here, there's classes in these parties, and the elites have been controlling these parties, and they ain't going to let go of them very easily. Well, and quite genuinely, a lot of the people who are uh, members of parliament and a lot of the people who are party bureaucrats, some of them come from working class backgrounds, think that capitalism is the best of all possible worlds. They would like a more mixed economy. They naively would like to go back to the welfare state. But they have been persuaded to the view that any socialism is either impossible or will end up being a disaster. Uh, they have no hope, in other words. Uh, they know who they are ideologically. Uh, and they will fight for that. I mean, in addition to being oriented always, to be doing a deal with the dominant class. That's their politics. That's what they're good at, striking a compromise with those who have power. And that's how the leadership uh, of the Democratic Party see themselves. Absolutely. Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton have made it clear. They're, they're there. To, capitalism is the best there is. We have to rein in the worst aspects of capitalism. I remember uh, someone you've interviewed and know well, Bill Fletcher Jr., telling me uh, back in 2008, 2007, 2008, that he knew Obama well and he knew the kind of community organizer he was. He was the kind of community organizer who would bring poor people in South Chicago together with the capitalist grandees of the Democratic Party in Chicago, put them in a room, and say, work out a deal. Much of your work has been on the role of the United States in managing global capitalism. Uh, well, at the moment, the uh, manager-in-chief is Donald Trump. And what does that tell us about the state of the Amer America and the, f and the state of global capitalism? So thanks for joining us. Please join us for the next segment of Reality Asserts Itself with Leo Panitz, where we're going to discuss whether, in fact, another world is possible. So please join us then. <laughs>